Okay, now we're back recording, introducing our hierarchical alleles. Equally, last, almost last is bicolor. So this is that reddish sort of German shepherd. It's only gonna be available if it's homozygous for this one, or if it's in the presence of the final weakest recessive allele, in this case, which happens to be black pigment, black pigment in this, in this animal. You'll see that the shift in pigments can be quite varied in their relationship with dominant versus recessive in different species. And only when the two recessive black alleles are there will you get a black German shepherd. And these are super pretty and cool. You ever see one? So going in on this, this makes things complicated, right? Let's have a little practice here. Hopefully everybody can read that up there. This is the framework of a question that I will definitely pose on the exam and the practices. So consider this our system for which to learn this outcome and this concept. I would have loved to do Pomeranian coat colors, but they're highly wild and complicated. So this is a little better. Equally on an exam, I'm probably gonna provide this image on the page. We spare no expense. We can't print in color at MSU without heinous amounts of money, unfortunately. So do you have that in your mind that the colors may not be quite there for you? I'll see what I can do about that. Maybe have some printouts. But let's take a look at the details here. And this is how these questions will always break down. I'll always give you this big text up here and then we'll get right to it. Sable mo mother, the bicolor father. You have about a 50-50 split of offspring, right? Because remember, we're still technically in Mendel land here. In this case, what would the genotype in this case of the mom be? If we are producing Sable and black and tan puppies from this pair. There's no bicolor ones. What is the best way to keep track of how the mom donated which gametes she had as a sable? Because that's what it's going to come down to. Things could get complicated if we had seen a couple, maybe a black or a bicolor outcome, maybe. But they didn't. In this case, I'll give you about eight, 10 seconds, draw out your best guess for what the genotype is. So we're looking at, oops, we're looking at the dad. He's either got to be double bicolor or with one black. The black being recessive, we don't have to, it can be either or, and we also didn't get any black puppies in this case, so we know that it got receded over in this case. Now, if we had half black and tan and half sable, which one of these allele combos likely produced that, given that these two, for example, would dominate both bicolors, these two would also dominate both bicolors. So close to your chest, is it one? two or three that is the mom's genotype in this case. Seems pretty good. There it is. Because if we're getting a 50-50, oh yeah, and we name alleles, weird. Sorry, when things get multiples, you can't just use capitals in lowercase anymore when there's multiple alleles, but if you've got two dominant alleles coming through 50-50 from the mom over here, they're gonna dominate this one and dominate either or of these. So it's gonna be a total of 50% because in each case, you're going to be either getting from the mom a sable gene or a black and tan gene. And those will dominate anything the father is gonna put forth. So assuming the father was a bicolor, it would look something 
like this. And I like to use slashes in this case and keep kind of the order of dominance as I go through here. And that can typically that can typically help sometimes. So black and tan, black and tan, <clears throat> sable, sable, two out of four, two out of four, 50, 50. So not too bad. Just changing the rules of the game that we already know though, which is good. Now, as far as practicing this, given that I'm playing my cards out pretty early here and saying this will be a big source of points on the exam, given maybe I'm probably gonna put two, probably not three questions, but hey, I could get lazy, right? So when I say, sometimes people ask like, how do I study more? What do I do? If, I, if you know the system that I'm gonna, I'm gonna use, and this will come up later with certain questions, start to outline all scenarios. People are always like, oh, I ran out of stuff to study. Luckily with this system, there are technically a limited number of scenarios that are even possible. And the more that you think them through and become comfortable, the easier thinking about this system in general becomes. So we'll look at A quick, for example. So if we look at a bicolor parent, there's only one set of bicolor parents that can ever possibly have a black pigmented puppy, right? They have to be heterozygotes for it. They both have to have that contribution black pigment, and they both have a one fourth chance just in a normal Mendel square to pass that one on. Equally, see how much you can play with these. It's a really good way to learn a system that can be overwhelming when we do it in flies, for example. So we're not doing that in lab. <laughs> we tried to keep things a little cleaner. And you know what? I like dogs, and we have a ton of zoology majors this year, so it's a good time. Okay, back to some small history and some small stories before we get into the last bit of nitty gritty on eugenics. So eugenics is determinism. You are born good, you are born bad. Now in, the Soviet, in Soviet Russia, as you can tell, if you recognize this guy, that's Joseph Stalin, there was a different take on heredity. And that was that heredity didn't exist that you could become anybody, that any organism could have any trait. This is Lyshenko. He is one of Stalin's advisors, scientific advisors on this. Now this was politically convenient because under communist philosophy and Soviet philosophy, you can become, even if you're bad right now, you can become a good member of the party. You're just gonna have to go to some places and do some stuff. So what I'm showing you is the polar opposite of eugenics where you had determinism, you now had complete moldability, let's call it. An equally scary sort of idea, right? And like I said, politically convenient for the fact like, well, you're not exactly up to what we want. We're gonna send you somewhere and maybe in 10 years, you'll come out the way that we wanted you to. Nothing about you can be determined. There's no piece that can be changed. Now that's not true, is it? There are pieces that can be changed. There are gene, genes do matter. So this led to historically, and we'll see this because, and it's a red text because it will come up later why he's wrong. What Lyshenko wanted to do was put wheat through periods of freezing so that then when you plant it, it would survive the cold, sort of force evolution, right? Remember we kind of talked about Lamarck with this. Now he's still saying in this case that genes aren't really a thing here. Just not even a thing. And that really what he's doing is just educating the wheat. No joke, that's pretty much the term he'll use most of his, most of his time. As you can tell here, this little wheat out in Russia, out in the cold, he would fake experiments to say that he could make this wheat out in the cold, it never worked. Now, since when you have a place that has such an inconvenient relationship with the truth as Soviet Russia was, you don't say no to anybody like Stalin. So you're just like, yeah, yeah, it works. Send out the seeds to everybody. The famines that resulted from trying this to plant wheat in the winter, it was bad. as a millions and millions of people out there. Now, can we manipulate capabilities of plants? 
yes. There are certain ways that even aren't in the, the code that we can do this manipulation with, but it doesn't mean just freezing seeds for periods. That just kills them. It's about it, especially at the temperatures he was trying. This is a fun story here. The winter rose is the idea, the hunch for crops that can grow through the winter, right? An entire doubling of the amount of food we could ever potentially have. So when you hear the word winter rose, that's what it's actually referring to, is someday that we could grow food that can withstand the temperatures even that we have here. <clears throat> okay. Believe it's a good time for a little pause. What I'm going to do next, I'm going to put these little cups on and kind of try and distribute these as evenly as possible. Kind of pass these down if you get some, and if you get some extra, I'll be back in a sec. Don't worry. Go ahead and take one. Don't worry, they're clean. Yeah. <laughs> oh, shoot, sorry. One, two, three, four, two. Right, and then he's got some interest for me. Yeah, because we got just his four here. Oh, shoot, let me go find one. Who's got an extra? You toss me that. Oh, never mind, thanks. Here you go. We oh, got two, yeah. Thank you. Oh, I want a demonst quick demonstration of why extreme takes on principles are always typically going to tend you towards a bad direction. I want everybody, now I'll tell you when to start. I want everybody to give me 10 tries. How many times out of 10 can you get it? Now, I'm not done yet, wait. Does it make sense that if you have gigantic oafish hands, this is hard, right? <laughs> or maybe smaller hands. Maybe you have really bad hand-eye coordination and part of that's predisposed, right? Part of it's also environmental, right? Some of you have despicably practiced this game, right? Oh no. And you would have practice in that. Others just simply have experience with coordination, right? Now equally, and don't take this personally what I'm about to do to a couple of you, does everybody have a fair shake on this trait that we're about to measure? Right, but I'm still, I still need you to flip that 10 out of 10 times. Is that cool or not? Maybe circumstances can sometimes ruin an obscure test that a eugenicist might say, oh, you can only have children if you can flip this cup nine out of 10 times at least. And Lashankowitz would say, you'll get there. You just gotta spend 10 years in Siberia until you can do it. So everybody give me their best shot at getting up to 10. And sorry for those of you that were, had some circumstances that were unideal. <laughs> okay, I'll take it. <laughs> Sorry, Anthony. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so this story tells a couple things, right? Some of you with the broken cups, you actually got a few done. That was pretty cool, right? You can rise up from something, right? That's possible. 
doesn't mean you got the fair shake, right? Doesn't mean that if you're judged on only, you must get 10 out of 10 here. You must get 150 on this IQ test, right? Who wrote the IQ test? What was your background? How much money did you have growing up, right? So I actually wanna, I always like seeing the histogram show up here. So just load up how many you got and then you can brag too. And if you got zero, you got zero, it's okay. So yeah, sadly, like I said, in both versions of the extreme, if you're testing on something completely obscure and can have environmental influence and genetic influence, is it really fair to say, well, only the people in this group over here can ever have children? And specifically, the eugenicists will take it sooner and they'll just say, all right, actually, also, everybody that only uh, that hit three or below, you're actually, uh, you're actually out of luck, too, in a, in a worse way. Not taking into account what the circumstances might be sometimes, right? That's good. We didn't get any zeros. That's happy. Everybody made a couple. But yeah, it is pretty. That is actually a pretty good little histogram, though, right there. Yeah, and that's actually a good way to showcase exactly what I showed on that little histogram with eugenics, right? Broad trait, spread, extremes either way. Good stuff, actually. Last year, I think everybody just put 10 because they were on Zoom, so you couldn't actually like be checked. Everybody's just like eight, tens, eights, and I was like, that's, wow. It is MSU, though, so who knows? Okay, just kidding. Love MSU. All right, good job, everybody. So principle demonstrated, I'll take the cups and, you know, do this next year, maybe, I don't know. I also don't want, I like reusing stuff, so it's good. Um, so, good little principle. What you have to watch out for when something new can be taken to an extreme, especially, look, look who's doing well with that extreme in a lot of cases, and you'll start to see, oh, the philosophy here with eugenesis was we need to rile up in Germany these people that we have just been elected to. We need a unifying force. We need to blame somebody. Oh, look, eugenics is actually a science back in the day. Let's turn this up a few notches. Lashenkoism, again, on the communist side, everybody can be different, but everybody can be made the same. And neither of those are true. So what we have is sort of the beginning that what these did was start to unravel that one trait is one gene every time. We still are getting there. We're up to the point where we're even actually much better at this than, uh, than we used to be able to. Now, one gene, one trait is very easy to learn the first way around, and that's good. And there are, these do exist sometimes, that's fine. But it's oftentimes this collision here. Gene, most genes inside of you need some sort of activating event, whether they are immune genes, whether they are stress genes, anything like that. So the quote that my, my genetics prof always gave was, genes are the bullets, environment pulls a trigger. It's not the friendliest example, but at the same time, I think it gets the principle across that the dispositions inside you do exist. It doesn't mean all of them will come to light, nor does it mean anything's wrong if they do. Our genome is ready to react to things. That's, and that's sort of a zoology thing too in that in evolution is that animals need to be ready to react to survive sometimes and the gene can react. The final phase of this class, we'll see that. But this gets characterized typically in nature nurture, this, these words right here, it's an incomplete picture. What we'll find in this class, luckily, is that these two things inform each other. But at the same time, this is just free. You're, just, you're off. You're good. Don't, you don't have to worry about turning anything in. But as far as like a plus minus grid for, would you say the genome has more influence or the environment has more influence on specific traits? And in this case, you could think of examples where the genome has full influence. We saw this with blood types. You will have the blood type passed down by your genes, by your parents, done. There are genes a lot of the times that we've talked about that may never exercise 
that bad phenotype. So we talked about having a BRCA allele missing. It doesn't always mean you're going to get cancer, right? Now, something fun, I always like this story, it's just heinous. Okay, so back when I was in middle and high school, it was fun for dudes to bleach their hair like white blonde. I don't, I don't know. Okay, so this is not me, by the way. Trust me, my friend's brother, he took actual washing bleach and put it in his hair. That's not how that actually works. He was bald for the next four years and he used to have nice straight red hair. Came out four years later, brown curly hair. And that was it. So yeah, the environment can definitely affect traits. Anybody that says that genes are the only thing that can affect how you look, which, you know, all this stuff, they're nuts. Now, in this debate, and I mean, it's fun to call it a debate, it's, the two are the same. Twins and identical twins give us a lot of clues. So, regular old fraternal twins, they are just like a very good measurement of environment. Let's zoom in on this first. Identical twins do share the same genome blueprint. So the graph that you're looking at is something called concordance. Concordance. What percent of twin pairs share a trait in, an, in identicals versus just in twin siblings? So on the top, you see things that have more influence statistically from genetics. On the bottom, you see things that are more environmentally informed. Something right here, like height, that's actually a pretty decent example that makes sense, right? There are a lot of most twins, and we're looking at like, what, 90% right there, identical twins will have the exact same height versus most regular sibling paternal twins. That looks like, I don't know, something like 60% maybe. So that difference right there is what you look for in a trait. So in an exam question, I'll give you some data. Identical pairs have this high of concordance percent. Fraternal regulars have this high. Does it seem that this is genetically informed or is it more environmental? New Minnesota actually has one of the best sets of twin data around. And a lot of that knowledge that we have comes from that database. You can also see a lot of stuff down here that we do know has a genetic influence, right? Say about at that point, but you see the, the white curve and the gray curve, see how big that spread can be with identical twins sometimes. This is down here, you know, with something like stroke or, you know, like arthritis. Identical twins are still only getting it 10% of the time, even if fraternals are only getting it like three, it's still pretty weak, right? If it was fully genetic, you'd expect the identicals to always have the same. So good example of 100% concordance, like I said, blood type every identical twin is going to have the same blood type as their twin. Non-identicals are just like siblings. They got the fair shake from their parents. 100% environmental. This isn't that you can learn language. This is the given language that a child can learn can be anything. There's no genetic predisposition to learning French or German. Chinese, English, anything. A baby can be born, two identical twins can be born, one taught French, one taught, let's say English, totally fine, totally environmentally informed. So this concept is really cool because you start to, it's, it's our first evidence before sequencing too that something nature-wise was informing big unknown diseases some of these that I highlighted, right? That they were informing them, they weren't the cause because it wasn't always that the genetic twins had the same thing. Now, remember Huntington's dominant allele, identical twins, they both go down with it, 100%. But these are complex traits we're looking at here. This is the, one of the only ways we can study these. A good one always is gonna be schizophrenia. About, Almost 50% of identical twins, if one develops schizophrenia, the other's going to. And then if you look at fraternal twin, same, pretty much same environment, that drops to about mm, 
So if this was a question on the exam and I gave you these data, the answer would be, it does appear based on the data, the genetic predispositions inform schizophrenia development. We have a lot of psych majors in here, which is interesting. And I like that because I can delve into examples like this and show that, yeah, there is a, there's a wiring that exists under the hood that does predispose somebody to develop complex, difficult conditions like this. Now, what triggers those conditions is a story for another class. But know that, that it, complex stuff like this does have that, does have that under network that allows it. But plenty of genes come with the capability to be altered directly by the environment. And so this is just a straight up example like, hey, phenotype can change strictly based on environment sometimes. Temperature sensitive flowers, for example, to coordinate which pollinators are around at which time. Now, this is a sort of 100% environment example right here. Similarly, we'll get into development later in the class, but the embryogenesis part of an organism, that developmental stage is very prone to small changes. And several genes, and like we see with Siamese cats, great example here, is that mutation in this gene leads to Siamese cats. That gene is involved in melanation but only the regions that were warmer while they were developing happened to activate in response. And you'll see that heat is often an activation signal for genes, whether that is in the embryogenesis sense or sometimes out as an adult. Talked about reptiles that can only lay eggs of certain sex at certain temperatures, right? Makes them sensitive to when the temperature changes a little bit. So the cool thing here is that, yeah, it's a gene, but there is an environmental interaction that's very important here. Pump that up, there we go. So this is the, like the phrase, like I said, gene mutation has to be there, but the environment does have to pull the trigger. Plenty of Siamese cats that don't really develop a ton of melanation just for whatever reason, just kind of luck of the draw how they were positioned. Okay. So to get to exam style, how I would test this interaction. And I think we're almost, uh, almost take a break. Two concepts that work together, penetrance and expressivity. The examples here, assume these are all little individuals, people, animals, whatever. Well, I use people examples, but still, it's okay. Imagine that every one of them has the gene allele that is the mutant. So start with penetrance. Penetrance is the idea that if the gene allele is there, the trait will show. You can have complete penetrance like you have with blood type. If you have the blood type gene, you're showing the blood types over 100 percent no questions equally there are some genes that the allele is a predisposition to type 1 diabetes but not everybody gets it that is incomplete penetrance the mutation may be there but for whatever reason, it does not come through. And that whatever reason is kind of like we talked about. There are a lot of environmental influences. So start with penetrance in your mind. Some mutations, a lot of the stuff we've seen so far has been, if it's there, it comes out, right? There's plenty of stuff that is a mutation. Nothing happens though. It's okay. There's reasons behind it. Expressivity gets a little more abstract, but makes sense after some examples. Expressivity is when gene alterations and traits exist on a sliding scale. A lot of the trait, very pronounced, tons, versus faintly there, but 
not much. Like, and you can kind of have an up to down with this, right? So let's look at polydactyl. This means a mutation in a development gene that causes you to have like multiple fingers, like six, seven, right? If you've got the polydactyl mutation, you're getting it. You're gonna have some extra digits. Now that number of how many extra digits is up for question though. You know, instead of 10 digits, you could have, you could have 11, maybe you'll get 12, maybe you get 13, super unlucky, maybe you get 14. So the mutation is there and it's coming through. Penetrance is complete. But expressivity, the level at which it comes through, can change. It can be really severe or it can be really light, barely noticeable. This is what we call broad expressivity. I know this is on the bottom of our little slide right there. So the most complex conditions will be a combination of both of most of the time, how to characterize these. The genes that we have zeroed in on for schizophrenia in that data that I showed, there are variants that are associated. Now, the variant, remember that let's say all eight of these people have the gene mutation that we're talking about that predisposes schizophrenia, but we only see three out of them, out of the eight, actually develop. So it is incomplete penetrance. The mutation doesn't always mean the phenotype. Equally, this person developed severe schizophrenia, right? One and shaded in. This one did like sort of second degree, this one did third degree schizophrenia. Little shading difference. The trait is on a scale of severity or expression as you would maybe call it. So the easy way to test these on an exam is say, describe a trait. Practice that I usually use is Huntington's. If you have the Huntington's disease allele, remember that big brain disease that we saw, it's a dominant allele. If you have it, it's coming. That is complete penetrance. But you may get it when you're 70, you may get it when you're 30. It may be really bad symptoms. It may be actually manageable-ish symptoms. Severity up and down can change. That is an example like polydactyl. You're getting it, but you don't know how bad or good you're gonna get it. So this is where, again, I can provide a few examples, but it's the best way to prepare yourself for these style of questions, obviously by doing the practices that I'll showcase in a maybe hopefully 24 hours is think of examples where each of these scenarios might apply. We've covered a few and you can plop them in there. And those, those are a good way to prepare you for how to sort of attack that. Equally, I should have noted here, this is narrow expressivity. If you get type one diabetes, it's, it's just there. It's just kind of on. I know that's a, maybe it's oversimplification, but that's where incomplete penetrance, but narrow expressivity, you have it or you don't. There's no sliding scale in that case. There's just a polydactyl cat because it's sweet, but it's okay. So last example before we head out. BRCA, if you do have this genotype with the recessive version of BRCA, Does this mean that everybody with that BRCA allele will get cancer? Right? Not everybody. Incomplete penetrance. Does that mean, does it mean just by the presence of the allele that those that do showcase the quote unquote phenotype of cancer? Some will get stage four, some will get stage one. Some will get stage two, some will three, right? So that's gonna be broad expressivity. You'll find that these two pair well quite often whenever the trait is a complex environmentally informed something trait, right? The two are typically going to go hand in hand. But, I'm capable and evil enough to do any example on here. 
keep it in mind. However, I would describe that situation, be comfortable with assessing which one it is. Okay. So I think the rest is blue, I gotta be honest, or green, and then we'll take our break. I think I've said we're gonna about to take the break like five times, sorry. Okay, you got to play flip cup though, so it's it sad. Um, so as far as environmental decisions, what they are, obvious ones exist where like if an animal or a human goes through a period of an intense stress, there will be certain genes that will activate in that moment to survive. Now, this is a nematode right here, actually. This is one of the best studied genomic or organisms, little microscopic worm, but it does have a nervous system. There's a trait that determines a sort of uh, gut malfunction that we call, but that trait is determined by a second master gene. This is kind of like epistasis, right? And the fate of that master gene though, to this day, we do not know how to mathematically coalesce why it shows up and why it doesn't show up sometimes. And what it comes down to probably is that in the single cell or small multi-cell decisions that are made in that, in those moments, could just be sort of a math fate type of equation of, was the gene present in the right spot at the right time in that moment to activate? And some of the worms it doesn't, and others it does. And we have no way to pinpoint that decision at the single cell level. So sometimes in all the universe that we know with math and prediction, sometimes it just comes down to just a couple pieces moving in the right direction at the, at the right time. And it's one of the things that's sort of sad, but cool about genetics is that there is un, so much unknown to this day. Right. Um, I think I just have. Yeah, why don't we just take a break there? We'll sit for a bit. So, yeah, like one, two minute break or so. Oh, in the meantime, here is me. Where is it? That's a good one. Here's me when I found out somebody got 100% on the exam. Impossible. Terrifying. Sorry, I use this Reface app a lot. It's really, it's really messed up though. Here's me offering to help you during office hours. Kind of evil, but I, I turn good later. Spoiler, sorry. Um, dogs. Yeah, that's about it. That's all I got for today. Anyway, those are fun. Oh, who dare email me? Anyways, take your break. Oh yeah, and if you want your notes from the test, uh, there's still a bunch of them are still up here.
All right. We will quickly end and we're definitely still ahead of time, which is good. So lots of time to spare for practice problems when exam shows up maybe on Tuesday that we'll have some time for. But kind of end on dismantling eugenics and then that's the end. Okay. So Nuremberg goes on uh, sort of under, not appreciated, but it was philosophically it was a big deal. It was the first time that we said that there are certain lines that humanity cannot cross. This is the first time that crimes against humanity were defined, that an objective scale exists that everybody is held account to. Everybody. This is Goring, he's commander of the Luftwaffe, among other propaganda issues. He was hung along with about 156 high ranking Nazis that they did capture. Text on the bottom is a little sub story I actually didn't know about. Stalin coming in on Nuremberg was like, let's kill. 50,000 to 100,000 German troops and send a message. Churchill actually wasn't too much better. He's like, let's kill all the officers, something like 20,000 people. So kind of an untold part of this. And then, of course, because the article is from an American, the Americans swooped in and said, no, 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 legal system, hooray. Anyway, kind of a scary detail on that part right there. Who knows what that would have been. But just like a virus, like I said, ideas can become beliefs and to people that have those beliefs and make them their identity, they can become truth in their eyes. And that is what's happened to so many people under a regime, under the idea that we are driven by science. We are worshiping science through eugenics, right? And it's through this belief that you can have, you know, kind of the sliding scale of, you know, there's a sliding scale of evil, right? Like crimes that happen sort of in the moment type stuff are very different than those that are calculated by people like this, Joseph Menengla, and what he did in Dachau concentration camps. So last little bit, a lot of medical knowledge that we know today when it comes to humans' ability to survive certain diseases, altitude, heat, cold, were found at Dachau. It's debatable to even cite papers that even reference these things to this day because what Menengla did was he collected twins, children usually. And to this day, you typically see a lot of Holocaust survivors that were identical twins for the reason being that one twin would be kept normal while the other would be subjected to diseases. Like I said, cold altitude chambers, anything that it took to basically in the name of science, because this Menengla guy was just like, oh yeah, I'm a great guy, I'm a great scientist. He was a freak. He was just doing these experiments, saying, well, I've got these twins, may as well excruciate one of these children in front of everybody and do all this shit. So it's very quickly, I don't know, it, the culture that at which this was acceptable had years in the making, but there were signs of it. And that's, that's why I try to like warn these stories a lot of the time. And the thing that he missed, it's kind of like we talked about today. This is not, the genome isn't the whole story, especially complex stuff. Most everything is something we call polygenic in a lot of cases. This is a bit of a new concept, but this is the idea that several, several genes, maybe even hundreds of genes inform a lot of different traits. These can be really important traits, you know, very visible traits like height. Height doesn't come from a single gene. Doesn't even come from 10 genes. Probably directly comes from, let's say, 150, and those each having an interaction with one or the other, maybe a couple others. Maybe you're putting this at 1,000 variants, possibly, out of our 20,000. Because remember, genes do different things. Not all of those are just height genes then. They have different roles, but they play a role in height in this case. And that's said so well right here with just the Latin polygenic multiple gene traits. This cannot be determined by a single Mendelian cross or phenotype. But it is somewhat determined by these genes, it does exist. Equally, height's a good example to show that environment has to play a role too. Don't feed a child, not gonna grow very tall, right? So similar to what we saw before with the histogram, and this was the ultimate finding eugenics was that it failed and they kept getting people in the middle for the traits that they were like, oh, this baby's a 10 out of 10. 
and it didn't produce 10 out of 10 offspring. Remember how to read a histogram too. Low extreme, high extreme. In red, low extreme and blue over here. Most people in the middle. So that's what this is saying is that about at 50%, you got a lot of number of individuals just in that 50 to 55% range. And that's the same with height, right? We have a couple of people in this class who are probably over 6'6". Six, six. We have a couple of people that are almost at five feet tall, right? That's okay. Now, height's a good example, but let's jump to some more important stuff. One of the biggest polygenic traits that is important is the power of your immune system. This is informed by thousands of genes and a bit by the environment and what diseases you encounter when you're young, let's say. Some people have an intense, strong immune system, right? So intense, sometimes it attacks their own, its own body. Some people have dispositions that make them immunocompromised. Both sides of these extremes are rarer than the middle, which is most of us have some sort of mix that makes us susceptible, but we have a defense, right? That's the, about the middle that you'll see. Equally, you know, I did a, I, I took a poll for how stressed are you on a scale from nine to 10 and everybody hit 10, so it blew my point. But as far as animal stress, for example, this is a good, this is a good look. So look at the squirrels, for example, on campus. They represent the lowest possible stress squirrel. They're running right up to campus among the biggest predators on the planet, us, and they have no fear. And that gives them an advantage. Now that no fear doesn't give them an advantage when they go out into a pasture and they get picked off by a hawk, right? Now, overly fearful squirrels will never go hunt for food. They'll die, right? So they're sort of, you kind of coalesce to the middle. So that stress level is more of a zoology thing. Humans, psychology takes over and we have a, other reasons to be stressed. This can get all kinds of different stuff on here. So polygenic is something that in a typical exam, I'll be like, what of the following traits is, or maybe is not a polygenic trait, right? This is where I'll use my examples. All right. Remember I gave you two genes earlier? <laughs> So terrible, right? You'll actually find these aren't too bad. If your head's going towards a Punnett square, don't. You can't make a massive, you know, 64 or, you know, 256 square Punnett square to find out, right? So what you can do, look at your targets and break them down piece by piece. Okay. Nothing about how the A gene tells how the T gene will pass down. Each gene, whenever I give you multiple genes to assign, can be treated as its own thing, kind of like we did with two, right? I was like, do a Punnett square for eyes, do one for development, and we can check for heterochromia, right? Let's walk through this one. So gene A, First one's first, right? Our desired phenotype is heterozygous A. That is happening two out of every four times. Perfect. Can I crunch that down to, no, I'll keep the raw numbers up there. That helps some people, including me. Okay, let's look at H. Parent, parent. You can see where this one's going, right? But the H phenotype looks like we are passing down all heterozygotes in this case. So we hit our target. That's just four out of four. Finish the other two on your own and give me the odds. We'll walk through it after.
typically this is going to be the format that I can mathematically test you for polygene type stuff. You can imagine that maybe these are two animals that we need to have an offspring that is engineered to have maybe a specific coat color, maybe a specific set of immune genes, maybe. And there are plenty of complex genes that are behave semi Mendelian. So this is okay. All right. I'll go ahead and follow through. Last one, or well, last two. The T gene. In this case, we're looking for offspring that are double recessives. We got a double receptive parent, heterozygote. Easy enough. Again, we got a nice two out of four there being our. Oh, well, I should draw it over the ones we wanted. Being double recessives, great. Okay. Last one, the R gene. This is a good old heterozygote parent versus heterozygote parent. Okay. So multiplying, remember these odds because lightning has to strike here, here, here and here at the same time to get the offspring that we wanted. So basically you can do the full math on this and that's, that's totally good. In fact, you can, if that's just your easiest way, if you feel quicker and you wanna use decimals, you wanna use percents, whatever it takes. If we start with 50%, that's times 100%, so that's just nothing. It's just 50% still. 50% of 50% is 25%. 25% or 50% of 25% again is 12.5%, right? So feeling okay about this one? Multiple genes flying around. Probably won't ask you much more than much more than this, I'd say. Actually, do give me a thumbs up. Yeah, do close to the chest. I can see how people are feeling. <laughs> Not too bad. Okay. So that's how you handle those. Go take a look here. Oh yeah, and I always share showcase data. I was a little too far, right? Luckily, everything got at least answered by half the class right, every question, even the hard ones at the end there. Equally, I ask for that expectation sometimes because, and what the difference was there, because that can inform me about potential things that we can fix together and ways that maybe we can change the approach either to the exam or the approach to studying or approach to class, anything that can maybe take us from, to, from ex, to exceeding our expectations instead of not wanting to meet them, or sorry, not wanting, but not meeting them. And then there's your typical histogram. The violin plot, so it sort of shows the, uh, sort of the spread a little bit. So if you met your goals, great. If not, there's plenty of points and plenty of time. And that's the point of this first one was to see that environment and see that type of question and how it matches up with the practice questions and how it matches up with class. Like I've told several of you, I didn't have a quiz last year. Exam one just came and it kind of rocked everybody. It wasn't great. So in this case, we actually didn't do overall collectively um, too bad at all, I think, especially for a first round, right? So it's good. Okay, we will start seeing these pedigrees. When you make, and oh yeah, last thing about the exam, you have a two-sided sheet of printer paper. You can use the entire thing as creatively as you want. I didn't see any, you know, I didn't really see any uh, examples that I would say, don't, you know, don't use that ever again type of stuff. There were some fun creative examples of notes actually. And take your notes because you can see what worked and what didn't for you. Pedigrees are very good because they are just a straight up strict outcome of the class. And those of you that want to do genetic counseling, maybe this is one of your best tools for it. 
among the molecular stuff that we'll cover. The pedigrees are also the testing ground for me to assess, do you know how an X-linked trait passes versus a mitochondrial trait? How does a dominant trait pass or recessive trait pass? The typical way that I ask these questions is going to be a set of five answers. Sometimes more information is necessary and say which style of passing through is the way that this works. So these are posted. We didn't have a ton of people getting the key info this week. So always, always get that a little bit before class because sometimes I speed through the slides because I make the assumption if I posted it, you've at least seen it once, even if it's just a scroll through. But there are certain rules, right, where certain things are bound to happen based on Mendelian genetics in a family tree, mathematically sometimes, right? If you have two dominant parents, you will likely see, you know, at least it is possible that you have a couple unaffected, right? Because if both of these parents are, let's say, heterozygotes for a trait, it is possible that both of these can end up being recessive. It can hide. That's possible. Typically with dominance, you will see each generation pass the trait at least once. Recessive. In this case, remember the shaded area is that the trait is happening in that case. The recessives can hide and they can show up unpronounced because in this case, the two white parents up here were just carriers for the trait. Now, another good thing with recessive is like I said, so let's do a little example quick over here. If T is for trait, you got a double recessive trait and you start to zero in on that. Do I already know the phenotype of all these children automatically based on these parents, right? Use like ironclad situations and rules like that to start piecing the bigger picture together and each pedigree can always become a lot easier. But you typically do want to eliminate possibilities one by one. That's why there's not always going to be like a ton of pedigree questions on an exam, but they will be a lot of, uh, typically a very good way to assess a lot of these outcomes. Okay, X-link dominant, X-link recessive. This is where things get a little tougher. You have to follow the X chromosomes as well, and you will start to see dispositions between two X individuals and XY individual males. Right here, for example, if this guy right here, you know, he has an X and a Y. If he's got a dominant X-link dominant trait, he will be passing that on to all daughters in this case, because we're doing the square up here. doesn't matter what mom has. He is giving that X with a large T to whatever her X is. And, it, and she's unaffected. So every single daughter is at least going to receive one X from their dad. And if the one X that he has is the bad one and it's dominant, it's showing up. Equally. And again, what you'll do as you get faster with these is you'll start to zero in on little pieces of families that are ways that you can prove that it's one or the other. So on this one, if it's X recessive and this female has two X chromosomes with both recessives, right? She's affected. No matter what, her sons are all going to get an X from her. They're all going to get it. But if the dad is passing on a good working X, that's going to go to all his daughters and they're going to have a dominant copy to save them from the trait. So these are posted, but the practices are typically a very good way to work through everything. Um, there is a large practice problem that I'll post that is a mass pedigree. And really it's not on an exam, but I basically ask, what's the trait? How's it passing? And give me the genotype of everybody in this thing. And that's how you can always 100% these questions. Seems a bit comprehensive, but I promise it's uh, okay. So let's actually go through a bit of a hierarchy on how to solve these problems first. These are the typical five answers I can show up with on an exam question for something. 
So here is the easiest way to eliminate the possibilities of any question. Number one, check if it's Y or paternal. Only males are affected and it passes from sons or from, uh, sorry, fathers to all sons. That is a very easy one to spot. And sometimes I'll throw one in there and people try and solve a million things when in reality, only males were affected the whole time and it was just passing to all of them, right? Was you follow this affected Y chromosome, it's going all the way down through males, nothing over here to worry about. Equally, rank number two to look out for. See if it's mitochondrial or not. If a female is affected, does she pass it on 100% every time? And, if a, and do affected males never pass it on? It can affect both. Females pass on 100% of the time. Affected males never pass it on. You can zero in on small examples to prove that to yourself mathematically each time. So those are the first two steps with any pedigree you take. Eliminate the easy ones. If it's not an easy one, two tiers of steps left. Step number three, differentiate if it is just straight up regular dominant or recessive. Find the pieces in each of the families. They are dead giveaways, basically. Does it skip generations, for example? And specifically, if it's dominant and two unaffected people have no affected children, you have to assume they're recessive, so right? Three is a good number to be sure about that. Equally, if it's double recessive, double affected parents will always have 100% affected offspring. And equally, you'll also see it able sort of to hide. But the best way to check is to find specific families and say, this could not be dominant here, right? This little eight, nine, 15, and 16 right here. Two unaffected parents having an affected child that can be dominant. One would be showing the dominant then, right? So use if-then logic to get, to get your way through these. This means that the only way that this one could come to be is if these were a couple heterozygotes for their R little trait. I use R's and T's, remember, just because they're good little, they're very different. So piece by piece, you can handle these. And typically, you will find specific relationships in each family that are giveaways. And then you start to try and prove that to yourself piece by piece with the others. Now, final step. Try and eliminate that is X linked. This is the trap a lot of people fall into. They try to make it look X linked recessive. It is much easier to find a situation where that is impossible and then cross it off. A good one here if this was if you were trying to eliminate if this was x recessive she would have to have this phenotype right if it was x recessive that means that no matter what one of these x's is headed straight for this guy and he's unaffected so that can't be the case got to be done now a lot of this will happen in the review session too but i do like to give uh give some examples here Last one, I'm unsure if I wanna do this one or these ones. Try this one, try the top one. Oh, wait a sec, I ruined this. Yeah, I do the top one, I have to get the other one later.
remember, it's always possible too. I'm not saying you should always rely on it, but piece by piece eliminate the easy ones first. Then decide, could it be Mendelian dominant recessive? Then try to eliminate the X-linked possibilities. I made a mistake in this last one. Now, most of the test pedigrees I ever do will be, they will have a definite answer, but the power pedigrees is actually to see what likelihood and chance possibility each thing has, especially when they're more complex. But I do like this one because it is gonna make you eliminate every single one of these. Okay. Why don't I leave you with that to think about. Now, the scrap of paper that I gave you, I want you to write down the three things you're confident coming up to exam one, your name, and the three things you're not confident in. This gives me ammunition for what to prepare for on Wednesday as well. But it's also sort of an affirmation that those three good things are going well. And that also tells me, you know, that gives me that data. So if you have one of those little scrap papers at your disposal, let me know. If not, I can come grab one. Oh, thank you. I think I distributed a bunch of them just out and about. There we go. Oh, you don't know. Yep. Yep. Same thing. While you're doing that, I'm going to eliminate the easy ones for you. There you go. So yeah, do put your name on it, obviously, because I'm going to coalesce that with how the quiz went and how to best prepare everybody to do better on exam one. <laughs>